way of doing it and the other one is the ethereum uh, family side of blockchains so we uh, saw how to install the uh, one of the like bitcoin side of it like uh, the flow the the blockchain that we use which is flow blockchain we saw how we install the node uh, and the wallets for that uh, we saw one session on metamask which is on ethereum so how ethereum and its uh, wallet is easily installed as a chrome or a browser extension uh, then one one of the sessions we had was on cryptography and how symmetric asymmetric keys work uh, which uh, form the backbone of any blockchain which because uh, blockchain itself uh, relies heavily on cryptography uh, then we also had a look at uh, ecdsa the algorithm which uh, allows us to create those hashes sign uh, transactions and stuff uh, then we did uh, a few sessions on transactions blocks hashes which uh, our colleague uh, ritwik did then we also had one session on uh, the testnet and mainnet uh, that we did and today is a, a follow up on those sessions and today we are going to see how uh, what blockchain explorers are and how do they basically work and uh, i will not focus a lot on the ppt and uh, the points as to how they work but we will mostly focus on uh, having a look at the uh, flow explore the blockchain explorers and seeing uh, right away how they are actually uh, operated how they work what is the insight that we get from them and so on and so forth so this is me abhijit uh, i am a blockchain and a product explorer blockchain developer and a solution architect at 366 pi and our, we are building a product on blockchain called flowcard uh, so the bar qr code that you currently see on my screen is my flow card uh, you can just scan this uh, on your phone and you can get my coordinates on flow card and uh, if you want you can just join us on the flow card journey by creating your own as well so without further ado i'll just start with a few pieces of information about what is a blockchain explorer and then i'll uh, move uh, uh, right into the actual uh, blockchain explorer see how they work so blockchain explorer basically is a uh, as a software is a is mostly a, uh, or usually is a, a web application or a portal uh, that allows you to see insights and information inside a blockchain uh, so let's say for example that if we are looking into bitcoin uh, since the beginning of uh, bitcoin there have been uh, numerous number of transactions millions and millions of transactions that have happened in the network but how do you see a particular transaction that has happened in the bitcoin network at any given point in time usually what happens is that as soon as we do a transaction we get a transaction id and that transaction id is basically a hash of the entire transaction that has happened on the blockchain now that transaction id is a unique identifier across the entire network for that particular transaction that you have made and that transaction involves uh, transferring a value from a source address to a destination address and that particular transaction id can always be visible in your own wallet the wallet that you own and operate that wallet will always show and it always has the information as long as you uh, own the private keys of that and you have that uh, access to the private keys your wallet will always show the number of transactions that you have made the number of transactions and the details of the transactions that you have sent or received wherever you are part of those informations are always available in the uh, wallet or the uh, node that you are running but it is quite uh, a requirement sometimes when we are making applications or if we just want to have a look at the blockchain as a whole and the number of transactions that are happening and if there is something wrong in the blockchain or uh, if we just want to see that when we made a transaction whether it went through the network or not whether the miners mined my transaction or not when was the transaction mined and so on and so forth and if we, if i just want to sort of see the entire blockchain ledger and uh, for any purpose any purpose we use these sort of applications called blockchain explorers so blockchain explorer in a nutshell what it does is it gives you insights and information about the blockchain its transactions and its workings how does it do that for any blockchain explorer to work it also requires an access to a blockchain node it's similar to a wallet that you have installed on your machine 
uh, for uh, any uh, type of blockchain that you're using it uses that because that is your gateway to the blockchain network so that node or that wallet that you have that acts as a gateway for your blockchain explorer to make uh, or communicate with the blockchain and because the blockchain in itself has all the information available in its own format but that format that is available in blockchain may or may not be something which is quite uh, user friendly because as a user if i want to search something or if i want to see uh, in a transaction who was the sender who was the receiver how much amount was transacted what was the information that was sent what was the block height what was the difficulty of that block at that point in time who mined the transaction when was the transaction mined so th these informations if we want to have a look at directly from a transaction directly from the blockchain itself using the node it is quite uh, i won't say it's impossible because that is where the data is but it is quite cumbersome and not very user friendly to make this user friendly these blockchain explorers uh, exist and they basically show you something in a format that you can make sense of uh, in some of the blockchain explorers you will see analytics as well like the number of transactions uh, the uh, the transaction uh, the amount in in terms of ethereum the amount of gas used uh, what was the tokens that was mostly used these sort of informations and analytics are also part of some of the blockchain explorers so how do these work so as i mentioned there is a node or a blockchain wallet that is that acts as a gateway for these blockchain explorers then you have a front end which is the ui or the portal that you look at and it communicates directly with the uh, node but if it directly communicates with the node there are a few problems or few issues that come into being what are those blockchain if we want to extract data or if we want to analyze data directly from the blockchain it would be very slow because for every sort of analysis every sort of search that you want to do and if you're doing it directly on the blockchain itself it will take a huge amount of time and if you uh, compound that with the number of requests or the number of people using the site it gets even worse so how do these blockchain uh, explorers tackle this is that they have a sort of a sync service that happens at the back end and what they do is they keep on uh, scanning the blockchain using the node that they have and they keep on sync uh, keep on syncing the transactions that happen in the blockchain all the information all the state informations and they keep it into a database that database could be a sql database it could be a no sql database document based information anything different uh, explorers use different set of back end databases that they use and what they use is they sync in the entire data because the a data that is available in the blockchain as well it's in form of json's and they keep this data synced up in a database and now what they do is they create an api layer on top of that database the database is constantly being synced from the actual blockchain the api which is on top of your database provides the data that you need on your blockchain explorers and that's how what they are able to do is they are able to give you search features they are able to give you analysis features on the blockchain as it is happens uh, and that also very uh, quickly because it uh, doesn't rely directly uh, on querying the blockchain itself but a copy of that or a synced copy of that is kept uh, mimicking the blockchain but on a sql or a different no sql sort of a database so that's how these uh blockchain explorers actually work and they allow us to uh analyze and visualize these informations so if we look at uh, some of the points that a blockchain explorer helps us in achieving are it, it helps us explore the transaction history of any address uh you can search any transaction you can search for any address you can search for any block by number uh you can uh so these are the basic three uh, transaction uh, types of searches that you can do based on transaction address and blocks some uh, blockchain explorers also allow you uh, to search by the data that has been stored and they also give you some set of uh, filters like uh, show transactions between uh, this uh, time frame and stuff so those are different uh, levels of uh, ui or ux interventions or uh, 
basically the features that different blockchains uh, explorers basically give you. So a transaction history of any wallet, receiving addresses, change addresses, as we mentioned in one of the previous sessions, that when you do a transaction, a transaction uh, originates from a source address, uh, the amount is transferred to a receiver address, but if the amount being sent is exactly not equal to the amount that you want to send, uh, there is a change that gets generated. So if I want to uh, send 20 coins to someone and I do not have exactly 20 coins, I have 25 coins uh, with me, uh, I will send 25 coins to you. You will keep the 20 and give me back the five. And that is called as a change. And that change also comes back to an address. Uh, that can be configured to be received onto the same address as I sent it, or I can receive it onto a different address. When it comes to a different address, the address where the change is received is called the change address, which is mentioned on the PPT. Now, there is another point, which is the third point. It allows you to explore mempool status. Now, a mempool is a very important and a very uh, interesting topic in terms of blockchain transactions. So, a blockchain transaction when someone uh, initiates a blockchain transaction a transaction can be initiated by me if i have enough uh, balance in my wallet i can initiate a transaction but whether the transaction will be committed to the blockchain or not it depends upon the process of mining the process of mining basically finds out and validates my transaction it uh, finds whether the transaction that I have done is a valid transaction or not. While these transactions are being mined, until they are mined, they are not part of the block or they are not part of the blockchain. But the transaction, as soon as I do, that transaction is in a pending state. And that pending state transactions are not just mine, they are for everyone who is part of the network and they are doing transactions. As soon as I broadcast my transaction into the network and until that transaction has been mined or validated or verified and becomes part of the blockchain, the part, the time when it is uh, not rejected, not approved, but still under a pending status, all those transactions which are in that state, they are said to be in the mempool. So a mempool is basically a memory pool. It's short for a memory pool and it contains all the transactions which are pending verification. So this allows you to uh, basically uh, have a look at the transactions which are in the mempool as, uh, as well. So as soon as you make a transaction, if you go to the blockchain explorer, even if the transaction has not been mined, you can see that the transaction is has reached the network and what is the status of it. Until it has been mined, it will show you that it is unconfirmed. As soon as it gets mined, it will say that it has been confirmed and has been moved to a block. I'll show you those uh, details as well in just a few minutes. Apart from this, uh, you can see who mined the block. Uh, what it says is, uh, just for the uh, simplification of the topic, is explore the pool or the person who uh, found or mined a particular block. Usually, the uh, the person cannot be identified because uh, because your uh, blockchain transactions are meant to be private and no personal information is gathered there. But uh, in case of uh, transaction pools or uh, the mining pools, uh, there is a group of addresses that uh, combine and create a pool and they uh, put their own uh, computing power into mining that. And that mempool has a name which is registered uh, into their... Uh, uh, into their mem uh, into their mining pools and that is somehow uh, reflected into the explorer as well that who mined it uh, there are different uh, numerous memory uh, mining pools that are available which uh, keep on mining information and mining these blockchain transactions by the way next point is it it allows you to explore the genesis blocks so what is a genesis block so every blockchain when it first started the first block that was created by the algorithm that is called as the genesis block and that is basically your root of the uh, chain and it is the first block first transaction that has ever happened on any blockchain and if you want to see uh, what was that what was the transaction that was made which addresses were involved in that 
you pretty much can see that just by uh, putting the address uh, or the block number one into your uh, uh, into your blockchain explorer and it shows you uh, that particular block details as it happened there it also allows you to see uh, the transactions that have happened uh, in blockchain every transaction that you do it involves a certain network fee or a transaction fee as well which is transferred to the miners to keep on uh, running the network and do the good work that they do so this how much fees was incurred for a transaction this information can also be obtained in blockchain explorers uh, what was the difficulty so the difficulty of mining a blockchain transaction it it is a uh, it is a variable value or it is a dynamic value it keeps on increasing and decreasing based on the status of the network if there are a lot of network transactions that are coming in and less number of miners that are working the difficulty gradually comes down but as competition increases, more and more miners come into the network and they keep on uh, fighting for uh, getting the rewards out of the network, the difficulty starts increasing. So it is a dynamic algorithm that basically uh, drives how, how much difficulty uh, of mining is currently uh, applicable on a particular network. Uh, what is the hash rate? Uh, if there are different sorts of information or data attached to a transaction, they are also visible into these blockchain explorer. And one of the most important thing, which is at the very end uh, in this PPT, is that these flow, uh, these blockchain explorers provide APIs, and these APIs allow us uh, developers uh, to actually integrate these services that the blockchain explorers offer uh, in terms of. Uh, visualizing or getting information about transactions in a very uh, uh, quick time uh, because doing that directly from a node is also possible but uh, it is not scalable like if you do uh, a lot of transactions like fetch transactions is only like getting information about trans uh, uh, transactions directly from the uh, node itself what we have experienced is that uh, the nodes that are running if we want to access them uh, the protocol that is used is RPC protocol, which is uh, remote procedure calls. It has its own limitations in number of transactions or the number of calls that you can make simultaneously. As soon as it reaches that, you do not get information and your uh, application starts uh, throwing exceptions. But these uh, flow explorers, the blockchain explorer, the APIs that they provide, they are absolutely working on the uh, web standards of HTTP and HTTPS and uh, they are REST APIs that are uh, exposed and they have their own uh, set of throttling uh, as well, uh, which is implemented. But with uh, some, uh, there are different plans where the throttling is increased or lifted uh, altogether. And some places there is no throttling and it only depends upon the backend infrastructure that is hosting them. So these allow you to uh, actually integrate these services directly into your application itself. So without... Uh, taking much time now i will dive directly into showing you uh, how blockchain explorers look and how we can basically work uh, in these blockchain explorers and how they are actually uh, used so i will show you two blockchain explorers uh, one is the flow site uh, which is the blockchain explorer that we use uh, with flowcard the blockchain that it uh, targets is the flow blockchain so the flow blockchain is a derivative or a fork of bitcoin uh, bitcoin uh, blockchain so it is almost identical to what uh, bitcoin offers but it has a very unique uh, set of uh, feature uh, which only flow blockchain offers which is called flow data and flow data is basically 1040 bytes of plain text information that can be uh, stored directly into the blockchain as part of a transaction so every transaction that you made in bitcoin you just transfer value uh, you transfer a set of bitcoins from one address to another it just transfers the value but in flow blockchain the addition to that transfer of value is the flow data which means that uh, the transaction is just a mechanism of sending data into the blockchain so the data that you uh, store uh, that can be a maximum of 1040 characters uh, it might seem not very much 
but trust me as developers or as software developers you would see the immense opportunities that you can do if you have a storage of 1040 characters uh, which is a immutable data which cannot can never be changed and that sort of information if can be stored on blockchain it opens up huge amount of possibilities and that is how we uncovered that using this we can create our product which is called flow card and i'll show you how that is also used so this is the flow site explorer that i would be showing you both on testnet and mainnet the other network blockchain explorer that i would show you is the ether scan so ether scan is basically the uh, de facto uh, blockchain explorer for the ethereum blockchain and its uh, subsequent coins that are part of the ethereum blockchain and i'll also show you uh, doing transactions and uh making those transactions and seeing how they start appearing into these so to start with a flow site uh, blockchain explorer you can see that a blockchain explorer is similar to a sort of a search engine uh, like what we have in our computers is that we work with different files and more often than not to access those files to get information about those files to get some sort of insight about those files we use something called as file explorers which in windows is called windows explorer in linux or others it's just called explorer or file explorer so that allows us to have a look at the information that we have stored on our computer organize them uh, see when the file was created who created that uh, when was it modified so these informations are available in the file explorer similarly uh, in the web we have the search engines which scan the entire web and give us insights about uh, different sets of information that we have uh, and same is uh, that these are some of the analogies that i can uh, make uh, for a blockchain explorer so this blockchain explorers that we are looking at they target a certain blockchain and it allows you to uh, explore and analyze that blockchain so if you look at this flow site what you will see in this first home page is that it shows you the few latest blocks that have been mined in the past few minutes you see that these are the heights that have been measured and these are the heights basically are the block numbers so till today in flow blockchain uh, about 5 more than 5 million blocks have been already generated and it's uh, actually happening uh, as we speak the block time or the time that it takes for one new block to generate is about 40 seconds to a minute in this flow blockchain which is also an upgrade to the uh, network algorithm that bitcoin has a uh, bitcoin uh, block is created somewhere between 5 uh, to 10 minutes so every 5 to 10 minutes there is a new block that gets created but that means that a transaction once you initiate that transaction can be validated and verified only after the transaction has been mined and put into a block and that can take about 5 to 10 minutes which can make uh, applications uh, uh, reactiveness or uh, how soon can you get those verified informations from blockchain a little slow because it is the architecture of the bitcoin network that it takes about 5 to 10 minutes for that to happen and sometimes it takes even longer in flow flow blockchain this is, has been brought down to about 40 seconds so ideally every 40 seconds there should be a new block that should be created if there are n number of transactions that happen in between those 40 seconds they become part of that a uh, new block that gets generated so that's these blocks so you can see that this shows you the latest blocks and the latest transactions that are happening so i would like to show you the latest block that was generated by opening it into a new uh, page So you will see that this is the blockchain block number five six seven six nine double six double nine zero. This is the hash of the block, which is basically its signature, and there is a summary information about this. And this is where the power of the blockchain explorers come in. And these informations, although are available in the blockchain data itself, but to uh, look at those informations and make sense of it, it is very difficult. So this is where the blockchain explorer. Uh, makes the information meaningful for us so it says that the number of transactions that happened in this block was one the height or the block number is this what was the block reward uh, so when we talk about a block reward 
as i mentioned every block when it gets generated it has to be mined so once it's mined which means that someone found the secret uh, hash uh, to basically generate that secret hash using their computing power and whoever gets that whoever is the uh, winner on that gets that particular hash mined first they basically are given the reward for that particular block so this block reward uh, it started with about 100 coins for every block so which means that every time someone mined a new block they got 100 coins at the very first genesis block but then after based on the algorithm that the blockchain uses uh, there is a concept of having that happens which means that the amount of tokens or the coins that get generated or is rewarded to the miner gets halved after a number of blocks have been generated so it started with 100 came down to 50 then 25 then 12.5 then 6.25 and so on and so forth so now the current reward that every uh, miner gets for mining a block is about 0.78125 flow which is not much but it still is allowing you to generate new coins so if i just put the block number 1 like currently we are looking at 5 676 Uh, 1990th number of block but if i want to look at the first block that was ever generated on this network and what was the summary for that i can do that i can just click on uh, the top search bar and put uh, one and enter and it will show me the block number 1 and what was the number of transactions and stuff so it says that it also had a number of transaction of one but if you see the block reward at that point in time was 100 flows and when was it done it was done first in june of 18 uh, 18th of june on 2013 so it ab it's about 9 uh, plus years uh, that the first block was done so in 9 years the block reward from 100 tokens has come down to about 0.78125 and there would be a time when this reward would stop why that would stop is because blockchain uh, tokens work on a concept of uh, basically it's a limited circulation so flow blockchain has a circulation limit of 14 million coins which means that at any given point in time when the last coin would be mined there would be a maximum of 14 million coins that can ever be uh, present in this particular network so people ask that once that happens what happens to the rewards so the miners they won't get rewarded for mining new uh, new blocks uh, so they won't be get uh, getting rewarded for minting these new uh, coins but the rewards for them would then be the transaction fee that will be available for them for every transaction that me and you do so every transaction we which we will do it already has a transaction fee attached and those transaction fee will be transferred as rewards to the miners for the work that they do so this is how it will keep on evolving and uh, it will just keep on working and because it will be, it is a limited amount of uh, tokens that are always going to be available in future as well uh, the demand for it uh, will keep on rising and that's how the whole economics uh, basically works so in this you can see the difficulty as well so the difficulty is basically the algorithm difficulty which uh, uh, means how uh, easy it is to decode the hash for that particular block and mine that so the lower the number of uh, difficulty the easier it is to mine the higher the difficulty the difficult it is to mine so that is how it basically works every block also shows you a summary of the transactions that has happened in that so you can pretty much see that this is the transaction that has happened in that and if you click on this which is the transaction id you basically drill down to the transaction level detail so previous page was showing the block level detail this is your transaction level detail in its uh, you can see the transaction id the size of the transaction as i mentioned that uh, every block tra blockchain transaction has a size in terms of amount of data that was committed to the blockchain uh, in bitcoin uh, in flow blockchain there is an additional 1040 bytes of data that you can also send which i will show you uh, with one of my transactions itself it says that it the network received this at 18th of june 2013 at 206 619 am and it was pretty much mined instantly 
and it was mined instantly at that point in time because it was the only block and only transaction that happened and there was no competition at that point in time in terms of miners and you could even do mining from your laptop as well but now that is absolutely not possible with the difficulty levels uh, so high right now that you cannot do that individually you have to join a pool or you have to have dedicated mining infrastructure available so this is where the transaction database uh, details comes in and it shows you that this is a new uh, generated coin so there is no source address in here if it was a transaction between two addresses you would see the source address on the left and the uh, destination address on the right but since it's a newly generated coins that were uh, part of this transaction it just says that no inputs newly generated coins and this goes in there what i would like to show you now is i would uh, like to show you a transaction that we can see live on the blockchain explorer for that i'm going to use the testnet version of this blockchain explorer so a testnet uh, version is uh, nothing different to a mainnet version its only difference is that it is looking up to the testnet version of the blockchain what is a testnet version a testnet version is an identical replica of the existing blockchain like flow blockchain has a mainnet which is the actual where actual transactions happen then you have a, a testnet Uh, which is exactly a replica in terms of algorithm everything is exactly the same in the testnet but the coins the transactions that happen they are meant for testing only and they do not have any financial value so you can do all your testing on the exact real uh, sort of infrastructure but that is not something which is financially uh, going to uh, Uh, have any burden on you so you do not have to purchase those coins or mine those coins directly you can mine those coins the testnet coins can also be mined by the way uh, but that is very easy to mine you can easily mine a lot of coins by just running the miner on your own machine for a few minutes and you can just do, get a huge amount of coins that you can get and start testing so what i would do is i would uh, use this testnet uh, blockchain explorer to do a small transaction using this uh, blockchain wallet that we have seen previously as well this is my flowcore uh, wallet which is on testnet i will do a small transaction to myself only and what i will do is i write a small message in that and we will see how it appears on the blockchain explorer how does it flow to the blockchain explorer so to do this what i will do is i have a few of my addresses that i already have generated so this is one of the addresses that i have i will just copy this address from here and then do a send operation and copy my own address in here and put an amount of one flow and a flow data in here is the actual message that you can put so i will do test transaction meant for learning event and i will do a quick send as soon as i do a send it tells me that the amount that i am sending is one flow uh the 0.00008420 flow is added as a transaction fee uh which it automatically calculated based on the amount of data that i am sending this is the transaction fee that i would incur and if i want to confirm this and send the coins i can put on yes if i do not want to send this i would just have to put cancel but i will do this i will click on yes as soon as i do this transaction you will see that i can see it on my wallet i can see it on my wallet that this transaction was done by me and all the information in here is pretty much i can see this and in here you can see when was the date what was the total debit credit transaction fee net amount what was the flow data everything now as soon as as i did that you can see that the blockchain explorer automatically started showing this in the latest transaction because it is listening for those and this part of the uh blockchain explorer is using something which is called as uh, web sockets and it is automatically scanning the network and as soon as a new transaction comes in it shows them here if i click on this transaction uh, it should be the same transaction id that i did so if i click on here i can see that my transaction id starts with c9b and ends with uh, f0e and if i check this this starts with c9b ends with f0e which means that this was a transaction that i did so now if i look at this it gives me an insight about this now what you can see is that it has a size of 420 bytes including my flow data that you can see at the bottom part of the screen this is the flow data and the 
data that I've sent was this, which I typed in, which was 10th transaction meant for learning event. Now in here, this is a size, this is a fee rate, this is the received time, and when was it uh, mined? It pretty much got mined instantly because we are on the test net. It is very easy to mine in there. What was the block where it was included? It also shows you a link of that. So it was included in block number uh, 2,227,160. And in here, you can see that the number of transactions that this block has is two. One is a mined block uh, transaction, which is this one, which says that newly generated coins were sent to this address, who is the, which is the miner's address. And this is the transaction that I did. Now, if I come back to my transaction, you will see that I sent one flow. One flow was the amount that I sent. But in here on the left, which is the sender information, you will see that 0 0.99 worth of flow of two addresses were sent. And why was that? If I sent one, trans one flow, one whole flow point, why was two addresses used for my input? That is because if you look at one of the addresses, is it doesn't have one full flow worth of uh, coins. So you can pretty much, I have used this analogy quite a uh, few times as well, that if I want to send, uh, like for example, uh, if I want to send uh, 201 rupee to someone, but I have uh, 300 rupee notes, just 300 rupee notes. If I want to send 201 rupee to you, I cannot give you the 200 rupee notes because that would be less than the amount that I want to send. But if I send you the 300 rupee note, which equal to 300 rupees, you will receive that. You will keep 201 and give me back 99. So in here also, it is exactly what's happening. So since the amount that I wanted to transact was one, but it did not have one in any address. What it had was 0 0.99 in one another 0 0.99 in one individually they could not uh, complete the transaction amount so they both combined and we got about nearly two uh, two flows worth of uh, coin that was sent as part of input but what we did is uh, what the receiver did is uh, he kept one flow which was the actual amount that was meant to be sent he kept that and returned back the 0 0.9938062, which were whatever was the change. And it sent that back to me. But since I did not mention in the transaction, which address to send it back to, the flow wallet in here calculated its own or created its own change address. And that change address is the one that you see in the bottom part. So this is the receiver, the actual receiver to whom I send it. And this is the one where the rest of the amount was sent, which is called as the test, uh, which is called as your change address. Now, the other information that you see in this screen is this important information, which is fee. And you also see the amount of number of confirmations or validations or verifications that I have. If I just refresh this, you will see that the two confirmation might have now changed to five confirmation and it just keeps on uh, increasing because more and more people are mining these uh, transactions, uh, the number of confirmations keep on uh, increasing. But even with one confirmation, it means that the transaction was valid and the transaction is made part of the blockchain. So this is all the information that you get uh, when you come to the blockchain explorer. I would do something similar uh, with the Ethereum blockchain as well. I will show you how this works. So this pretty much works with the same uh, set of rules. Uh, you can search uh, things by address, transactions, blocks, but Ethereum also gives you uh, uh, option to search by tokens because Ethereum allows to create uh, its own tokens inside Ethereum blockchain, uh, like different sets of uh, uh, tokens that uh, have been created on uh, your uh, Ethereum blockchain, there are numerous number of tokens that have been created. So if I, if you just go to the top 20 tokens that are uh, used, like this Tether USDT, uh, USD coin, BNB, Binance USD, Shiba Inu, Matic token, these are all the tokens that have been created on top of the uh, Ethereum blockchain. So if you want to uh, explore any of those, you can do those as well in Ethereum because it allows us to do that. 
in this what you will see is that it gives you some sort of analysis as well in terms of prices uh, market cap last blocks transactions gas median gas price uh, the number of transactions and the volume of transactions that has happened in the past uh, 14 days and stuff so these are some of the small analysis and reports that are also part of this but in a nutshell everything else is pretty much similar you have these blocks that get generated you have these transaction that get generated if i click on any of the block you will see that this is the block height the status time stamp proposed on the number of transactions how many uh, transactions happened 132 transactions happened in this block and what was the recipient uh, fee what was the block reward uh this was the person who mined it the address of that person what was the total difficulty what was the size the gas used these are the, all the information plus there is also some extra information that is there which is the extra data but this is all in its own uh native information uh, format the transactions if you just click on that you will see all the transactions the 132 transactions that happened is in this particular block and you can see a list of all those uh who was the sender who was the receiver how what was the value everything is pretty much uh, mentioned in here what was the transaction fee uh, what was the method whether it was a transact transfer whether it's a buy uh, set multiple asset data because ethereum also has these uh, trust smart contracts and everything that are uh, pretty much uh, involved uh, in the ethereum blockchain network itself so these are the different types of Our transaction transfers or transactions that have happened in this, which is also part of the blockchain explorer in EtherScan, that you can pretty much see. I will do a small transaction, or what I will do is I will uh, use the Rinkeby testnet network. So EtherScan, like FlowSite, also has its own testnet as well, uh, but it has multiple testnets. So the one that I usually use is the Rinkeby testnet. and it has its own ether scan version which is the rinkeby testnet explorer and you can do the exactly same things and if i uh, go to my metamask wallet and i uh, these are the transactions that i did on my metamask wallet so there was one small uh, smart contract that i uh, created uh, while uh, doing some tinkering with this is this wherein all the information that was gathered was pretty much here what i can do is click on the copy transaction id go to the rinkeby testnet explorer and just paste that and hit enter and it will show me my transaction my contract that i uh, performed and that will be available on the testnet rinkeby explorer and i could pretty much be able to see all the details about it so as soon as i do this you can see that this was a transaction hash block transaction from to and uh, to is not an address but it's a contract so the recipient of this at this transaction was a contract so if i uh, click on this it shows me the actual transaction detail which is the internal transactions for that contract and it tells me all the information so these may or may not make sense to you right now when it comes to these transactions because uh, for uh, to make sense of these you need to understand uh, smart contracts solidity how they work and then as soon as you are able to comprehend and have a context on those you will pretty much see the value in these but i just wanted to show you how these basically are uh, kept and uh, uh, stored and how they can be used what i also mentioned was that these blockchain explorers allow you to have access to these informations that you are seeing on these sites by means of apis so if i look at the flow scan or the flow site api uh, this is a documentation of their github Uh, repository which is the flow site api and you pretty much have the url of the your flow site explorer and after that you just have to use the uh, apis ur api endpoints that are mentioned in here like if i come to this like uh, if i want to see a particular transaction data like what we did on this uh, like if i click on this transaction this is the information that i get from blockchain but this is coming from an api itself so how do i as an application developer have access to this data and use it in my application so for that i need to have access to this transaction apis so if i go down you will see that there is an api with uh, this endpoint which is slash api slash tx and the tx id so if i use this let's say that i come in here in the testnet and i replace this and i say that this is my url api slash tx slash tx id 
and I use the transaction that I did on my wallet and I copy that transaction ID in here. I copy this and I use this into the URL. So this is a get API that happens. And if I click on this, you will see that this is the data that comes in. This is a JSON data, which is not very pretty to look like right now, but I'll just make it formatted for you to have a look at. And we will just have a look at this. Okay. So this is the information that you see that it has the transaction ID, the version, lock time, what was the data? These are all the inputs that happened. This are, these are the, if there are any double spends that happened, this gets flagged, the number of transactions that come in and uh, the block hash, the block height, time, when was it, uh, when was it put in the uh, system? When was it mined? Uh, what was the value in and value out of the system for this? Everything is available in here. And what the blockchain explorer does is it decodes this information and shows it into a form that we as users understand. So this is a, a URL or the GitHub repository that I would quickly uh, put these URLs in there so that you guys can have a look at these in your free time and uh, just go through with them. And if you want to learn how these work, so I'll just quickly copy these across. And these are the Flow Blockchain Explorers. This is the Ether Scan. So I will just quickly copy paste all these URLs just for your benefit. And come to the last part of my session, which is how we have used these APIs into our application. And this is the Ether Scan API endpoints. Uh, this is the Rinkabai one. So these are the URLs that you have. Uh, similar to the FlowSide APIs, you have the one for Ether as well or the Ethereum as well. The only difference being that is the Ethereum uh, endpoints uh, are, you have to basically uh, have a sort of uh, a license for that. Uh, so what they have done is they have uh, segregated their uh, APIs into two parts. One is the community endpoints, which of course is free. Then you have the pro APIs, which uh, are not free and you have to basically purchase them. So there are different plans that you have, uh, which you can use to get access to these APIs if those are something that you require. So uh, the Ether APIs uh, are community based uh, as well and also pro APIs, which of course will give you different sets of uh, data points and analytics that you can uh, use in your application if need be. Now, the last part of my session, I would just show you what we have done as Flowcard uh, in uh, using these Flow Blockchain Explorer. But just before that, I would uh, show you the Flowcard uh, website itself. So this is the Flowcard uh, dot app website, which is the URL for our site, which uh, we have created. It's a digital business card on uh, blockchain, uh, specifically the Flow Blockchain. Uh, it uh, stores your data in an encrypted format directly on the blockchain itself. I'll show you those informations as well. Uh, so you just come in here, you can log in either with Google or sign in with LinkedIn and you get your uh, own flow card, your digital business card and blockchain ready in just about a minute. And after that, you can share and exchange your uh, flow card with different users, different flow card users. And it has a huge, uh, amount of possibilities that are available, which we are unlocking and uh, implementing as we speak. So this is my flow card, which has all my coordinates, my details about myself. Uh, and in here, uh, this is uh, mentioned that it is an org verified, which is because this card is my uh, organization associated verified card as well. And it is on blockchain as well. So I would, for this session, I will just go to this session, uh, section of the app, which is my flow card ID. And in this, what you will see is something similar to uh, what a blockchain wallet is. So every flow card user that gets onboarded, they get their own uh, blockchain address, which is a flow blockchain address. And they are uh, credited with uh, 0.02 flow uh, cryptocurrency. And that is used for their all the transactions that happen. And every transaction that happens for them on the blockchain is pretty much reflected in this. So this is a sort of a mini blockchain explorer for the block uh, for the for your own 
uh, flow card transactions that you do. So if you look at this, I have made a huge number of transactions uh, in my flow card. So this is the first transaction that I did, which was registry. Uh, so for the first uh, blockchain uh, transaction that my address did, it was a registration that happened. Uh, if I want, I can just copy this or open this uh, in a new tab. And what you will see is that it opens the flow site itself. And this is my transaction for the registration into flow, uh, flow card. And it happened on November of 6, 2021. I did my transactions. Uh, it, my card was registered. And this is the data. It's a protocol information uh, because we do not, uh, we keep the entire flow card information that you saw on my card that is entirely kept on blockchain, but in an encrypted format. So that uh, even though it's a publicly available information, but still your personal information and your privacy is uh, taken care of. So this is my registration transaction. Then I had a few updates if I look at that. Uh, so this is an update transaction that happened that also got into the blockchain and it is the transaction that is in here, which is the protocol information about that. And that is pretty much available in here. All the transactions that you see in this, which is my blockchain transactions, this entire thing is leveraging the Flow Blockchain Explorer APIs. And from there only, I'm getting all the data, all the information, when was it submitted, when was it mined, which block, how many number of confirmations, and access to that information directly from the Flow Blockchain Explorer. So this is one of the implementations of those APIs that you can do. But saying that, there could be numerous. You can have your own use cases. You can have your own uh, problem statements which uh, require those solutions. And you can use these and get access to these information that is uh, quite easily accessible. So that's pretty much it from my side, guys, for this session. I know it's quite a, uh, it went uh, quite long. Uh, I did not intend it to be, but I just wanted to uh, share all the information and the details with you. So uh, if there are any questions, any feedback, anything that you guys might have, I'll be happy to answer those. Uh, so yeah, this question from Sogato, does mempool have a limit within which a block has to be mined or rejected? No. Uh, so transactions, when you do there, uh, when you send them, uh, mempool is where the transactions are waiting for, uh, waiting to get mined. It is up to the miners, uh, whether they pick it up or not. So when mining happens, uh, it's not that every transaction is uh, picked for mining. Uh, because mining is quite a uh, cost intensive activity, miners would want uh, to maximize their profits as well. So if you uh, make a transaction and you put or set a very low amount of transaction fee, it is quite possible that the miners may not pick that transaction for verification because it doesn't make uh, financially it is it's not financially feasible for them basically so they won't uh, pick it up because there's a lot of work that they need to do but in terms of reward or uh, in terms of reward they do, are not getting much so they just leave it uh, in comparison to other transactions that might give them more rewards uh, but seeing that the transaction never gets deleted from the blockchain it is still part of the mempool it is still part of the mempool, but it stays unconfirmed. So if your application is uh, programmed to uh, check these verification statuses, whether the transaction was validated or not, it will always say that the transaction is still pending and it will stay pending uh, until some miner picks that up. Or if you as a miner want to uh, pick that up by not having any sort of uh, filter in terms of which transaction fee items to pick or not, then there could be a time that it might get delayed quite late. So that's, uh, that is something if that answers your question. So yeah, it, there is no time limit as to when the transaction should be verified or rejected. So it just stays there until it has been mined. Any further questions, anything? Thank you, Vijit. It was a very insightful session and, uh, Thank you, interesting one and uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining in today it was a uh, great to have all of you here uh, just to remind uh, the next sunday uh, the session is about consensus mechanism on blockchain 
uh so that's again will be taken by one of the colleagues so if you're interested and if you really like the session please do register the register link is on the chat window and of course uh we'll push it back again to social media uh skype podcast has a youtube channel all the previous sessions that we have done is all available uh so we try to bring experts and expertise uh while i mean the folks who are actually working on and with blockchain they come and share their insight and information and it's always fun to learn together. So if you have questions, comments, please do. I request if uh, you can also share it with your friends and share the content on social media and bring more audience here and we can actually create a nice blockchain momentum to begin with. So have, have a happy learning and a great rest of Sunday and weekend ahead, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.